Um, uh, where do we start? First of all, people might not know this, but we have the nation will be watching when the Supreme Court takes this under the, as far as the abortion bill, because we'll hear the name uh, Mississippi over and over. And uh, Becky, you're you're a player in that. I authored this bill several years ago. Yeah. We uh, we did the first bill uh, we did. Andy Gibson, of course, uh, was in the legislature at the time and played a big part with me. Went through his committee. We did the 19-week bill, and then we did the 15-week bill, mm-hmm. which is the bill that goes before the Supreme Court in November. Now. Um, I got a lot of messages from a lot of people. Uh, I'm well aware that life begins at conception, but when you're starting to chisel away at uh, yeah. at this, yeah. you have to start somewhere. And this was a no nonsense bill. It's uh, it gives you plenty of time to make that decision if if you're going to to keep your child. But there has to be some limit. And you know, I'm I'm a little bit excited about something, Paul. When the Supreme Court ignored Texas recently, it gave me real real hope. And Lynn Fitch has done, our attorney general has done a a yeoman's job. And her uh, direction is to give states state rights and to, you know, the people's voice would be heard in their state. And uh, I believe that that uh, looks like it's it may happen because they have remained silent on Texas. They're taking up. You know, this little woman from Brookhaven, Mississippi's bill in November. And, uh, you know, I'm not a lawyer, but I understand that, you know, for lawyers, that's like going to the Super Bowl. But uh, so I'm pretty excited about it. It, 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 It's really disheartening to see how vehemently these people, the Pelosi's of the world and and, uh, Joe Biden and others are fighting against this, the to make sure these kids are aborted, I, 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 it just it hurts me when I see what is going on uh, with this country. And that and, the White House took a stand on killing babies. Yes. You know, h- how sad is it? But, you know, I, I believe that uh, this is an archaic law. It hasn't been changed in 50 years. Yep. And I think yep. things look good for for a change. Even this law would save millions and millions of lives if they take it at the 15-week uh, but if they put it back in the hands of, of states, you know, we've already done a heartbeat bill just like Texas. That was several years mm-hmm. ago. We're all in line to kick right in to where we feel it needs to be. I would say that this is probably one of the most evil leaderships in the White House and in leadership uh, as far as the House and Senate uh, the, and, the, and, the, and the executive branch that we have had in a long, long time. And I don't think it's only me. You even have, we had one Catholic priest the other day just uncorked. I mean, he uncorked. How he retains that position, I do not know. But he went before the people, and here is what he said. On top of that, we've just recently elected a Catholic president, and he is Catholic. He's baptized. He is a member of the family who is diametrically opposed to all of the basic moral principles that are proclaimed by the Roman Catholic Church. Not only abortion and the sanctity of human life, but the sanctity of marriage and this gender silliness. How in the world did that happen? I'll tell you, if he wasn't Catholic, I probably wouldn't be so upset. He's a member of my family. He's the most powerful man in the world. And he is absolutely opposed to the basic understanding that God is the author of life. How in the world did this happen? You want an answer? I'll tell you the answer. Because our bishops have been silent for 60 years through bad catechesis and cowardice. They have barely said a thing. A few papers here and there, there's things they could do. You say, well, why don't you do something? I'm just a little diocesan priest. I'm a grunt. They're the apostles. They have the voice. I just work for them at their privilege. They can get rid of me tomorrow. How have they allowed this to happen? What is it that they really believe? How poorly have they educated you? Good Lord. Wow. Amen. <laughs> Man. <laughs> oh, sign me up. Me too. I want to go to his church. Yeah, even if I'm Protestant, I'm moving my letter, you know, <laughs> one way or the other. But, I mean, that guy had the courage to just put it on the table. That's right. But 
here so we are. So when do you think this is going to happen? When, when, what, what is, what's the date on this when they take this up? Well, um, it was October, and no. now I understand it's November, and, and we don't have a date. I've just, um, you know, begged Lynn to take me with her and let no. me just be there. <laughs> <laughs> it, and, it, it will be historic. It will. And, and again, um, you're going to see the left go out, to, to, and, and things have changed in this country. You know, I often say, Becky, that when you go back, it's a little bit like smoking when we were young, as far as boomers are concerned. We had no idea, you know. And, and back in those days, uh, as far as abortions are concerned, they were a hell of a lot rarer than they are now, of course. But the reason for abortion itself was premised, is my understanding, is because if somebody did have a child that a, that a team of physicians says this child may not be able to even survive outside or the mother is going to die. Well, and also, if you think back 50 years ago, there was no birth control pills. There were no IUDs. Right. There were no uh, ways of preventing some of those things. And I think that, that it came from desperation uh, yep. on some people's part. But, you know, it's 50 years old. It's time to look at it again, and that's what we want to do. Somebody said, uh, and I forgot who it was, and I wish I'd remember, and I, I'll need to uh, research this, but said this is going to devalue life more than we've ever imagined. And, boy, they hit it on the head. That's right. And I have to tell you, I've been a little bit quiet about it because when it first came out, it was, oh, man, the emails and the mm-hmm. the messages I got were cruel and, um, you know, just – it's hard to believe how low they can go, you know. But, um, uh, you know, I'm at the point where I'm proud of it. I can't yeah. wait for it to happen and and uh, bring there, it on. There is no other subject available in America today where the act is so horrendous you cannot talk about it in detail, nor, God forbid, you see it. But... As long as you can't see it and you can't talk about it, you can't describe it piece by piece, practice by practice, then they're all for it. And it's just, it's, it's amazing. I want to talk about Centene. Uh, there's some movement there. And also nurses, because nurses are not happy in the state. Why? Well, we'll talk to one of the nurses who's been around for a while. What, at least four or five years. Oh, just a few. <laughs> and uh, let's talk about Centene. I- I'm guessing here, just just a guess, I'm guessing the only thing that's changed from the last time we were here and from the uh, Shad White uh, investigation, the Attorney General's investigation, is that Centene probably is It's going to cost them more as far as lobbying money and put more money out to politicians. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> it's probably going to be only, the only numerical change. I mean, it should be. I, I can't see any difference. Um, I sent you a, a news report mm-hmm. that the uh, head of Centene spoke to his board and employees. This is a guy who makes $25 million a year. That's $8,000 an hour. And he, his promise to them was their profits were going to go up by a third next year mm-hmm. and and boasted about that. And if you remember, this is from Medicaid money from the states to take care of the poor and the elderly and the disabled and the mentally ill. You know, his speech wasn't, Paul, let's take care of the diabetic children this yep. year. Let's have a goal of making sure that they get all the supplies that they need or that the mentally ill get the medicines they need. No, his speech was more money coming in to us. Yep. Now, their profit after all their bills were paid last year was $111 billion that they've made off of Medicaid. Uh, that's nationwide. That's nationwide. Yep. And And for me, that means that Patients went without. We already know providers are not getting paid, so the patients aren't being taken care of. And we want to sign a contract with them again? Yep. You know, give me a break. I'm, I'm so sick of it, I, I just can't see straight. We have, uh, we have developed a system, a template, where we're putting our health care and our taxpayers' money in their hands, and the only way they make a profit is suppressing that very tech, that very health care. That's right. 
And it's, it's just a catch-22. It is. You know, we were just taken over uh, our mental health system by the courts, and mm-hmm. part of it is because we don't have uh, the community mental health services where we need them. Right now, each community mental health will tell you that the people that owe them the most money is managed care. Yeah. So we yeah. want them to be in the, in the black and not in the red in our community communities to take care of the mentally ill, but we have a, a managed care Medicaid companies that won't pay them. So it's just like, when it, who's going to wake up here? I those, just, those have to be signed by, the legislature has no say-so in that one. The, well, we don't. But you know The Division you know of what, Medicaid Paul? signs that? That's right. But you know what? The legislature could say, get a backbone and stand up and say, no more, we're not taking this anymore. Well, they could change the plan, could they not? Absolutely, we could. And um, we don't have to. We can get out of any contract we want to. Is there any rumblings about some alternatives out there that you know of? Well, I'm not so sure that regular Medicaid was not a problem. You know, since I've been in the legislature, Mm -hmm. the cost of Medicaid has doubled. And so, and the number of patients has gone down. So, you know, nobody can show me where this has helped us, yeah. where it saved us money, it took care of our patients, and uh, that it benefits the state of Mississippi. It benefits them quite yeah. a bit. And, and growing fast and as growing far as their fast. profit level is concerned. Plus, they stole money from us, Paul, and we slapped them on the wrist, and they didn't have to admit that they were yeah. wrong. They just we and and we're going to keep going with them after they we know they stole money. That fifty five million the people in the state of Mississippi, it, it, we won't see that on an individual basis. That'll go into the general It'll fund. It'll just go in the in the kitty. Whatever's and go left back to after Medicaid. the lawyers have paid for. Yeah, them. Uh, I agree with that. Uh, there is, and I, I caution to say this. There is a couple of things I've heard about that they are. They may be talking about, and I don't want to mention it yet because I think it was off record, so I won't say anything here. Uh, but I'm, I'm hoping there are some alternatives that are happening uh, out there. So, well, I hope you're right. Let's talk about <laughs> nurses in the time we have left yeah, here, because absolutely, these contract nurses are they all gone, or are there still some here? Well, there's still some here. You know, we still have our hospital. Uh, beds haven't emptied out. So there's still some here. And the reason they're here, Paul, and I have to tell you, I've been a nurse for over 40 years, Mm -hmm. but um, I will tell you that if I were younger, I'd be gone. You know, if I can make $10,000 a week somewhere, I'd be gone. Uh, I have a friend of mine just left a couple of weeks ago to Texas to make $10,000 a week. Um, wow. And is is um, is that a long term? Do, do they set the, uh, the the period they're gone? They'll be uh, I think she left for six weeks, six weeks. Now, when she gets there, she may end up staying longer. Well, yeah. but, but, you know, it's going to be very difficult for these nurses that have been going around the country making a lot of money to come back to what they were making before. And I I have said nurses are very unappreciated. I've Mm -hmm. been a nurse all my life. And, you know, it's it's kind of like a teacher. We've been a female job. And, uh, you know, hate to say it, but, you know, we talk about teacher pay raises every year. We don't talk about nurses. And this has proven you cannot run a hospital. What's the average salary of a starting nurse? Probably about 50000 and and, and, not, and starting, I would probably say more. You're not going to be able to specialize into ICU and ER mm-hmm. and those kind of things as a as a graduate. So the specialty or the training of a contract nurse is no more than just the, uh, the registered nurse that's working now. It's just that they're on contract. Well, yes and no. Uh, the contracts that are out there are for critical care nurses. Okay. So it, it but they're is still lot. getting paid more than critical care nurses who are full time. And, and remember that there's a lot of nurses that stayed in their hospital mm-hmm. state. And, and you, where do you stop? You know, home health nurses. I'm a yeah. home health nurse. You know, we've been yeah. battling COVID. There, where, where does that end? I don't I don't know. I'd even ends. heard at one point that somebody said that the nurses through the association were ready to strike. They were so mad. Well, they're mad because the nurse from out of town sitting next to them is making one hundred and sixty five dollars an hour. And they're sitting there, you know, making thirty five dollars an hour. Mm. So I'd be mad, too. 
What does it look like as far as your your hometown hospital? Our hospital, you know, I, I think all of them are at the numbers are looking better. A mm-hmm. few weeks ago, I'd have told you we were at a breaking point, but things are looking better. And, and I just don't want this to become the norm. And I'm ready like everybody else. We need to get yeah. this under control. Have you had your vaccinations? I have, you know. Have and you got a booster yet? Uh, I'm not quite that old, but no. I understand that. Uh, I'll be honest with you. If there's one available to me, I will take it. But I, I want <laughs> I want to say this out loud so yes. everybody will hear me. Yeah. I don't believe in mandating vaccines. So, uh, no, I agree with you. I, I, yeah. I think if it's mandated, it needs to be on a private sector from uh, what the business wants to do and not the government. But uh, in, in talking to uh, 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 yesterday... To the good doc at UMMC, we were. I'd ask her, uh, Doctor Woodward, is there a possibility that kids are going to be mandated this, like vaccinations, mm-hmm. when they go back to school? And she felt pretty sure that in the foreseeable future, it's going to be COVID's going to be added to the uh, list of other vaccines. I, I don't agree with her. I have to tell you why it won't get through the Mississippi legislature, mm-hmm. and it would have to come from the feds. And I just don't. And and. States have always done their own vaccines. When you look at the number of kids who are getting this and those that wind up in the hospital, it's a small percentage. Do you, what age do you as a nurse, just on a personal basis, just uh, Becky Curry, what, what are you, how young would you say? Well, a, as a nurse, yeah. in my personal opinion, if you really look at the statistics, Paul, uh, it's very low in young people. And then you're going to hear about the one death. This, you know, 12-year-old was yep. on a vent. But, but you'd really have to look at the numbers. And I would say the governor has done a pretty good job of looking at numbers. Yep. And, uh, you know, so if you hear of one tragedy, does that mean everybody should have to go do it? I, I, I would really have to. I'm glad that's not my job. <laughs> I, I mentioned this at the top of the hour. This is a, this is a topic that's been so confused. It, it is. really is. When you start looking at flu deaths over the last uh, several years and you look at COVID, I mean, we've had, my God, a lot more deaths as far as COVID's concerned. But then again, which ones of those were flu? We don't know. We don't know. We have no idea. No, we don't. We had a a situation the other day where there were some people who died in hospice. They probably had a week to live. They contracted COVID, so they are listed as COVID. That's a COVID number. That's right. But even with that... COVID has killed a lot of people. There's no doubt. So we've confused things. We have confused things. And you hardly hear about somebody having a heart attack or a stroke and dying anymore. It's all COVID. Always good talking to you. you.